Biology Chapter 19 Ecology The study of ecology is best understood if we begin with the creation mandate, Genesis 1.28. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So what is ecology? Ecology is a study of the relationships between organisms and between the organisms and its environment. Ecologists are called upon to do various things, among which are study the relationship between existing organisms and their environment, to predict what would happen if some factor were changed, and recommend steps to change an environment or the organisms in it. So, to begin our study, we first of all must understand what an ecosystem is. All living things and non-living factors within a limited area are considered part of the ecosystem. An ecosystem is made up, first, first of all, of various communities, and each of these communities is made up of populations of different animals, and this population is ultimately begins with an individual. So, the ecosystem itself is interacting parts working together to create that. The, abi the abiotic uh, environment is made up of non-living factors uh, such as radiation, heat, light, wind, water, and soil, and, and other things such as that. The biotic community, all the living things in the ecosystem. So it's made up of two parts, the abiotic and the biotic. Let's look at the abiotic factors a little bit more in detail. An ecosystem experiences radiation from the sun, and that provides heat and um, ultimately affects the temperature of an area. Uh, the light or the amount of light is used by plants to carry on photosynthesis in which they produce sugars that will support life. Another abiotic factor is the atmosphere. Uh, depending on what altitude the, uh, we're talking about here as to the uh, density of the atmosphere the, or pressure uh, will affect uh, that, bi uh, that biosphere. One thing that's maybe not readily obvious is the rotation of the Earth. The rotation of the Earth is responsible for affecting the movement of air over the Earth's surface, which we call wind, and breaking it up into various air currents uh, that we experience, uh, especially in our part of the uh, of North America. We have the winds blowing from the north that generally bring cold uh, air and then from the south which brings in warm moist air that uh, and when these two collide we have uh, weather. But the rotation of the earth also affects ocean currents uh, and so consequently the uh, oceans circulate with and uh, Water, for instance, in the northern hemispheres tends to uh, circulate uh, clockwise ar around a large ocean. And then water, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail. Most uh, free water is cyclic. It's part of a water cycle. So here is the water cycle. Uh, since it's a cycle, you can begin almost anywhere in this process to understand it. Uh, let's begin over on the left, where heat from the sun causes uh, plants to transpire, which means to give off moisture. Uh, 
in the middle we have evaporation that the heat from the sun will also uh, evaporate water from the surface of the earth and as that uh, moisture is cooled it condenses to form clouds and then these clouds und other, under further uh, condensation will produce precipitation when that uh, reaches the earth's surface uh, much of it runs off and collects in rivers and streams and ultimately to lakes and uh, the ocean uh, but some of the water uh, seeps down through the soil we call it percolating and it will eventually reach down to the water table where we if we drill a well could possibly draw water from that and sometimes some of this will uh, naturally come to the earth's surface in the forms of springs uh, so there's a water table uh, and then trees and plants can draw moisture from the water that has percolated into the soil and then they in turn can transpire and give moisture to the atmosphere and and the cycle continues so in addition to radiation and atmosphere rotation of the earth and water there is the topography of the land that will affect an ecosystem that is the lay of the land is it flat is it desert like um, like in a desert for for instance or is it uh, mountainous uh, is it a high plateau things like this affect the biosphere and then the soil that makes up that area is has different mineral contents uh, some soils are very rich uh, and allow plants to grow readily and others are um, maybe very rocky and the mineral is hard to uh, be obtained by the plants gravity also is a abiotic factor uh, it is responsible for th causing things like tides and so some of the biospheres uh, are affected by the tides uh, as they come in and as they go back out and then fire which not maybe obvious but fire is not only harm is always harmful but it can be important fire removes the organic debris from an ecosystem if not managed properly we can have uh, forest fires and prairie fires and things like that um, but the fire also is responsible for enriching the soil studies have shown that fires are not necessarily always bad they do help uh, enrich the soil and some plants actually can't reproduce without a fire uh, they um, some of the seeds are, are very tough and they need to be uh, weakened by a fire so that the new plant can sprout fire also uh, improves wildlife habitat uh, some ecosystems are replaced with uh, without periodic burning and uh, the periodic burning as you can see in this photo right here the trees have that are burned have allowed the lush green plants on the forest floor to be able to sprout and, and um, thrive now let's begin talking about the biotic factors within the biotic factors we have a population and what is a population those are all the animals of the same type that are living in a particular geographic area like we could have a population of elk or a population of deer or a population of beavers to study these uh, populations uh, game biologists often are responsible for counting the number of animals in a certain area uh, and they that will give them the idea of the population density how many animals are living in a certain space and then they also look at how are these animals uh, populations arranged how are they dispersed and then how do these animal populations change over time by counting these like yearly they can see if the population of some uh, animal is increasing or decreasing 
uh, are they in risk at risk of becoming uh, endangered, or are their population thriving? And then it also helps them to understand uh, what are the nutritional relationships between various animals and various populations of plants maybe that are growing in a certain area. So in the nutritional relationships, we have some animals or some plants that are producers and uh, they're responsible for producing all the food that the rest of the animals are going to need. We refer to those as autotrophs. They're self-feeders. They produce their own food. And then we have those that eat that those producers that we call consumers. They're heterotrophs. They eat uh, plants. They uh, So consumers uh, consume other organisms. And in uh, consumers, you can divide them up into different categories as well. We have primary consumers that usually uh, are the herbivores. They eat plants, be like cows, for instance. And then we have secondary consumers. They're usually carnivores that eat um, animals that eat plants. And then we have what we call tertiary uh, consumers. These are second level carnivores. In other words, they are carnivores that eat other uh, carnivores. So when we look at the ecosystem, one of the things that we're concerned about is how productive is are the, um, for instance, the plants and things like that at uh, providing nutrients for the ecosystem. And the rate of photosynthesis carried on by the producers in an organism can be evaluated. And that is often uh, affected by the soil moisture, soil that is able to support more plants than soil that is uh, uh, dry much of the time. Uh, the type of soil, fine textured soils like clays are harder for moisture to penetrate and also harder for plants to, roots to uh, go into the soil very deep, deeply. So there, that will affect their productivity. But if you have coarser textured soils like that are sands and silts that you often find along um, floodplains and things like that, there's lots of moisture, plants grow uh, better, and uh, they have a lot more moisture available to them. So the, the, that type of uh, ecosystem is going to have a uh, lot taller grasses, uh, like in the prairies and things like that. So um, energy in the food chain, uh, only 50% of the total light that ever enters uh, or is available to plants uh, is actually absorbed. So if we save 100% of the sun that shines on a given area, only 50% of that is available to, for plants to abs actually absorb. And of that 50%, only 2% is ever really converted into sugar by uh, the plants. And of that 2% that's stored as sugar, 50% of it is used by the plant itself. So because of that, of all the available energy available to the plants, only about a half a percent is available to the first consumer. That would be the her herbivores. And every time uh, each layer of consumer is getting less and less and less. So the population of the initial plants needs to be great enough to support larger populations of uh, consumers.